YouTube is in an editor skill shortage. I need help. I'm hiring. I'm looking to hire a editor. I'm looking for the best editor. There has never been a bigger demand for YouTube editors, but the jobs go unfilled. I mean, it's not like there's a lack of editors. There's so many of them available, but they also have to have that skill and the incentive for them to use that skill for you. I feel like if you find someone good at $80 an edit, you shouldn't keep it at $80 an edit. It is so fun to be like, you're crushing it. More money here. Sarah Dietschy is one of the few creators who cracked that code. A former editor herself, she shared how she did the impossible. She took an editor from Fiverr and trained them up to be exceptional and stick around. So what I'm hearing is attitude is literally everything. Oh my God, yeah. And the willingness to improve. This interview is brought to you by the best video podcasting tool, Riverside. Honestly, if you're not using Riverside for all of your virtual meetings, you're making a big mistake. I've even been using it for consultations. As soon as we're done, I get to send them the entire recording. And not to mention the recording quality is freaking it's good. Whereas other virtual meeting services can only do up to 720, Riverside can do 4K. Which is why we like to use it for podcasting. And we love it because it records each audio and video track separately so that editing is such a breeze when we get into post. Which means our editor can get started on cutting it almost immediately. And even if you or your guest has absolute garbage internet, it doesn't matter. Because remember that one time when we were in the hotel room? I mean, the call kept on jostling. I thought we lost it, but because Riverside records locally and then uploads, the call was perfect. And it's easy for the guests. They don't need to install anything. You just send them the link and you can start recording. It even says like, roll out the red carpet. It's kind of, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it makes it, me feel special. It makes me feel so special. If you're podcasting, creating video content or recording online calls, then sign up to riverside.fm for free and use code editing podcast for 20% off. And you can find that link in the description and we'll see you back in the interview. Well, I've been doing YouTube for seven years. And when I was trying to find editors, I was like, I'm just gonna edit every single video. I can never find an editor. I've been through so many editors who couldn't take feedback and improve. I would get to the point where I'd be paying pe people a lot of money. They would send me an edit that I can't even begin to give feedback on because there's so many things wrong. So I'll sit there and re-edit the entire video. It'll take me a longer time to re-edit the video than if I just edited it in the first place. Edited it. Edited it. Edited, edited, edited it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so I did that for two or three years and I was like, this is impossible. This is just impossible. I can't find anyone. But then I just got back to like, okay, let's just, let's just try a lot of people. Don't stick with one person who's not delivering for six months to a year because that's not helping anyone. Kyle started as a Fiverr editor for like 40 or 80 bucks. I forgot what it was. The first edit, it like obviously wasn't all there, but he took feedback really well and he improved really quickly. It was fun for me to like see him improve and he was improving and then me to be like, oh, let's double your rate, double your rate, keep doubling it, keep doubling it. So I think he felt, you know, the wind at his sails too. So we just had a good kind of back and forth. It took, I would say, a solid year to now get to the point where we are, where if I give him a proper YouTube video, he can take it from zero to a hundred. When the guy before him, he started, like the fee that he gave me was so high, but I was like, okay, let's try it because it seems like you're legit. So we started basically at like my highest pay grade that I would pay an editor. Video after video, he wasn't getting better. His attitude wasn't an attitude of like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'll improve upon that in the next video, what he's giving me is worth like a hundred bucks because I can only use basically the A roll that he cut down. I can't use anything else, you know? You can't really decrease someone's pay. Mm. He wasn't showing initiative. He wasn't changing. He just kept giving me the same thing every time. So when Kyle came around, it was easy to see, even though he wasn't delivering exactly what I needed in the beginning, he was improving every single time. So what I'm hearing is attitude is literally everything. Oh my God, yeah. It's absolutely everything. And the yeah. willingness to improve. You said that as he was improving, you were doubling his rate. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. really something that's fascinating yeah. that I feel like a lot of creators probably maybe don't do. Yeah, and that's because I want to keep them and I want to keep them stoked, you know? Like, I feel like if you find someone good at $80 an edit, you shouldn't keep it at $80 an edit, you oh, know? Oh, it's cheap. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. You, it's like pay for the value. <laughs> exactly. And it's fun as a person on the other side because I've had so many terrible experiences with freelancers. It is so fun to be like, you're crushing it. 
more money here. You're rewarding improvement. Exactly. Like, hey, you're getting better. Here's some more money. But then part of the process is actually working with someone and working with them over time to get to that sort of similar mindset, that creative mindset that you have. We call it the editing language. Yeah, because when you guys asked me on the phone call, yeah. what's your editing language or whatever, yeah. I was like, wait, what? what it's, you, it's, it's our lingo. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, a, it's like a modernization of the word style. Yeah, yeah. your style, because I'm not organized, so I don't have that beautiful notion sheet that is like, this is how I edit and do things. It also required someone to come in and me be like, hey, here's my YouTube channel. Watch this type of video, this type of video and that and just figure it out. I don't think that works though. No, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> but I took the time to really with every edit be like, this video is this type of video. Here's an example. And I would like on Slack do like five paragraphs. Let's see an example. If there is some sort of, uh, I saw you react that you just get like a really bad email. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We've lost all the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The brand uh -huh. new will fell through. Brand new fell through. <laughs> I know. So it's basically like all the footage is up for the Hummer EV video should be pretty explainable in between the Notion video page that lays out the first half of the video along with the A-roll segment. So sometimes for videos too that are more scripted out, I'll have it all scripted out in Notion and with like red text will be my editing notes. You can take some creative freedom on what you leave in and out because I talked about the same thing a few times in the A-roll and GoPro and want you to use the best take in the edit. That's something that took us a minute to get there, but I think that's so powerful for video editors. This iPhone has a 40 megapixel sensor. You don't need that information in an edit four different times. You want the shot that is the most entertaining or powerful or the most informational. You're giving him options. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The iPhone footage and GoPro shots were confusing in the project. So I laid them all out chronologically in the timeline and cut the fat in some places so you can just start cutting. I don't want to use his time to sit there for four hours trying to find individual things. So because I filmed that and because I lived it, sometimes I'll actually take the front end of the project so he can spend most of his valuable time like with the actual edit. That's a great gesture because to an extent you're respecting his time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, yeah. it's like, it's like, I'm, I'm, I, hey, I know this is a problem. I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to help you as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, I, say, in, I said it with trauma with my trauma. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's kind of like a give and take because I know it will take me a shorter amount of time because I filmed it. So yeah. that's when I'll step in. And so he's almost now adding adding to it. You know, it's no longer just me being like telling him everything. I, I would never sit there and cut out the background and shoot me over to, you know, like a Photoshop background for comedic comedic effect. So now he's adding more youtube -y stuff. It's kind of fun for me because I get to say like, hey, I really like what you're doing here. I would have never thought to do that, but that fits really well as a YouTube video, keep doing that. You mentioned the Notion document as well. Was that kind of like your script? And then you kind of also did pre-edits in that script as well. Yeah, so it changes edit to edit. This is what I need to work on is kind of standardizing what my YouTube channel is because every edit, I'm almost going back to the whiteboard, which is very frustrating. But if I plan it out more, usually that sets up Kyle up for more success. That Hummer EV video, I did use the car and then I scripted my A-roll, right? The tech videos that I hate the most and don't get good views, they're frustrating, I have to re-edit them like a bajillion times or when I make the video as I go. I've been so used to that process because if you film and edit everything, you can just figure it out in post, fix it in post, right? Yeah. That's what we like to say. But when you're working with other people, you can't do that. So I'm trying to get more organized where if I have a talking head you know, part, I will script a lot of it out in Notion and add editing notes and then all of the extra stuff I'll just throw in a Slack message. So there is a learning process there where it's like if you are the editor to your own content, you can create the problems for yourself. But that is kind of irresponsible if you make those problems for someone else. Exactly. And that's the past year has been my life of minimizing this. Yeah. <laughs> for me, I've had to learn how to get better at just giving feedback. And because I yeah. would be over understanding where I'll be like, oh, you did this wrong, but it's fine. I'm just going to fix it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go on the computer for six hours and then I'm re-editing the entire video. And that's not that's not good for me or them because then they're not learning. So I have weekly YouTube videos coming out. Yeah. And I'll usually film on Monday and they'll come out on Friday. And it's literally every Thursday night, I'm like still giving feedback mm -hmm. to my editor. It's interesting because she edits on a different editing software than me. So Ooh. I don't even have the ability to finish ah. it. So I can't even like, I can't touch it. So I have to be able to give that feedback to get it exactly how I want. 
And so it's, oh, that that's actually been drive like, me crazy. Such, <laughs> it's been a great learning process for yeah. me though, honestly. Yeah. So we have, we have a few editors on, on this team now as well. And they'll send, they'll send us uh, a version of the podcast or a version of the intro. Yep. But then part of it is for me of like, yeah, I can look at this video in like two, three days. And then you never do it. And then I never do. And if you just sent the feedback on that same day, it would have been done. So <laughs> I suck. <laughs> no, but I understand that. I understand because yeah. I'll, I'll still to this day do it to Kyle. I'll be like, okay, this is the video. Can you just cut down the A roll? Because I'm really excited about like the B roll that I shot. I'm going to go in there and do all this. And, you know, he'll send it and a week will pass and I'll get busy with shooting another video. And I'll yeah. be like, if I just let Kyle take that entire video, it would have been done by now. Oh, this breaks my you heart because that is a very good <laughs> truth. A lot of times, you know, Kyle will get an 80 or 90% there. And I know exactly the pieces to tweak yeah. to make yeah. it more of a Sarah Peachy video. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's way quicker for me to just go in there and move those Lego blocks. Yeah. And other times, if it's easy, I'll just kind of, you know, explain it to them. Uh, I, w I was working on the uh, Mr. Beast's blind video. I was still learning the Mr. Beast editing language. And so my version was 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then Jimmy was like, Okay, I've watched this. Here's how you can get it down to eight minutes. Interesting. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of... So when I watched that video, mm -hmm. my first thought actually was like, oh, I could watch more of this. Why mm -hmm. wasn't this like a 15-minute video? But that's that's the whole point of, I guess, I missed a breeze video yeah. is, oh, I want more, right? Yeah. And, and you feel excited at the end mm. of the video. Big lesson for me on top of that was I was still struggling to try to get it down to eight minutes. But then also I have a direct communication with the, the Mr. Beast editing team. And I kind of had, I started asking the question, hey, what is the Mr. Beast editing language? And so it then became a collaboration experience where actually they started helping me on that edit. And so, yeah, I had my 12 minute version and then like they were then able to get that down to eight minutes to a far more like optimize like efficient version and in terms of Kyle's case it was okay I've done as much as I think I can I've got to 70 80 percent there you then did that final pass he then watches that new version and go and he knows oh exactly that's what I missed exactly I had that exact experience like yeah you're right I missed that what and then it's kind of like a oh that was so obvious why didn't I think yeah. of that yeah no and exactly. now I and then and now I understand the, the Mr. Beast editing language so much more because I got it 70% there, and then they got it to that last 30%. But very early on in the process, I asked Jimmy, what do you want to feel? And he says, I want to be mind blown. And then that was the word that stuck with me the most. And so every cut I started working towards is, will this blow everyone's minds? Will this, will this blow Jimmy's mind? Will this blow audience's minds? And then just kept on, and then like, that informed my edits a lot, simply because I asked that question. I understood what he wanted straight away so well let me ask that question what it what is it like coming from jimmy does he send a paragraph or do you just get on a phone and he's like i want this this and that do it like what is that like i'm a slight exception to the rule because i've managed to develop a good amount of trust with jimmy where in in the same sense when i trust uh, daniel our intro editor more than i trust myself jimmy trusted me more in that sense like hey i know you could probably do this better so off you go. But I still asked those questions. They had a story producer. They had like hundreds of pages of documents that kind of detailed everything that that was shot. And so I was able to find things. Really hundreds of, so what would you just do control F and like find if you needed someone crying? Yeah. Then you could find that through those documents or how does that work? They had a really interesting process where they, I had assistant editors who went through all of the selects and they and they did describe, here's what happened on the selects as a text box. And then I was able to search okay, I needed, I did, I did, I needed someone crying, crying. So in my case, it was like, okay, this is an emotional beat. I think I need a reaction of someone crying. I searched that word and I had that selects right there. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's cool. But I think on top of it, it is, I was front loaded with information that helped inform me to know what to do sooner. Mm hmm Rather than, <gasps> Hi. there she is. If there's any peachy fam here, they know that this is like my dream to have a podcasting cat. Come this, here. this is our podcast. It's yep. our podcast. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Big jump. There nice. we go. Well done. Parkour. It, but like I said, it was because I asked a question straight away. Like, what do you want to feel? Mind blown. And it just really, really helped inform me of my choices. I still sometimes do uh, the final pass of these podcast edits, like just trimming it down a little bit more. But if I could communicate better with our editor, Tyson, on here's how you can spot these little trims. You have to decide what is the non-negotiable and let everything else fall to the side. Like with my YouTube channel, there are certain videos that are very personal to me and so those are the videos that i will just edit from start to finish and i'll give myself that but everything else i'm like sarah you do not need to edit this like 
Hummer EV review. This is not your, what's it called? Your magnum opus or whatever, you know? You have almost a decade of work on your YouTube channel that is 100% you. Like don't let your pride get in the way of like moving forward in life and in your career uh, because- you use hard truths. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you know, then that frees up time for me to get a cooler shot. You know, I have the new uh, Rivian SUV and I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna edit this, but it frees me up to be like, what are some cooler shots that I can get that makes the video better in a different way? So you just have to pick and choose. You can't have it all. <laughs> yeah, I really, really enjoy some of the aspects of this editing production and, and especially in, in the post-production and there's some things I'm struggling to let go, but you're right. It, but if it, you enjoy it, yes. then, then do it yes. and don't feel guilty about it. If you enjoy it, then why delegate it? Well, yeah, like for example, uh, our Euphoria intro on our podcast, like that was something I was really, really excited about. With The Last of Us coming in, I really wanted to do that intro because those are things I'm really, really passionate about. But then on top of this, and this was a really heartbreaking moment, we had also interviewed Colin and Samir, and we wrote a really, really great intro for them. And I'm like, I'm so excited. We have those intro editors who's like Daniel, he also goes by Dodford. He's better than me. He's better than me at doing this. And like, I would love to do this, but I actually trust him more than I do myself. And so it broke my heart, but I gave it to him. But that's so exciting though. Yeah. And I'm sure he crushed it, right? Oh, he's still editing it right now, but I 100% I, I I know he's gonna crush yeah. it. Yeah. And Turns out, yep, he did crush it. That is such a great joy for me when I find someone who specializes in something and they can just take that and crush it. Cause I've been through so much like, heartbreak with trying to hire someone and they just miserably fail. And so now if someone just comes along and one does their job, mm -hmm. I'm like, amazing. Mm -hmm. Let me pay you more. But then if you like over deliver, that's like a whole nother story. I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, do more, do more. Yeah. So I'm actually pretty good with that where if someone delivers, I'm okay. I'm like, how can you stay? Yeah. How can, <laughs> how can we work more and do more? And I have this project over here. How about you do this? Right? Yeah. I think that is probably the secret of it. It is to an extent, trial and error with multiple yes. people until over time you stumble upon the person that has that organic natural more. fit. You just have to like hire more and fire more, essentially. We need to have a serious conversation. I need you to stop spending your entire day looking for music that actually isn't even that good. But Track Club is actually full of bloody great music. Their entire library is banger after banger and mash. We also know that audio is essential for creating an emotional world for your audience. This is why beyond having great music, Track Club has Mixlab, which allows you to use stems to customize it to your situation. For example, there's this documentary song that I really liked that sounded hopeful. But if I soloed the vocals, that sounded scary. Or I just used the mallets to create a build. And Track Club makes it super simple to avoid copyright strikes. Paste your channel's URL into Track Club and Bob's your uncle, your videos will be cleared automatically. My uncle's name's Dave. Guess what? They're offering your first month for free. So go to the link in the description and get your free month of Track Club today. You said that you're, uh, you started out editing yes. without any shooting, without any camera. Where'd you get your footage? How did you start? What's the whole story? So my dad was kind of into photos and things. You know, I have a lot of fun clips as a kid just with his, you know, VX camera. So he was always into that, but he never used it a ton. So he had a Canon T3i that I would use with a kit lens. And I would get to the point where I had enough to edit a little bit, or I would use other people's footage. I mean, school projects, I would do music rap videos, every single history project, economics project. I somehow coaxed my teachers into like doing a music rap video for the project instead yeah. of a report. So still to this day on my channel, you can go and watch a music video called The Law of Supply and Demand. And it's me and my friends making a rap to a Nicki Minaj music video. And I filmed it and edited it. So I just, for some reason, I had the editing bug early. Just video editing was always my expression towards the world. So I play basketball and there was a teacher versus students basketball game. And the teachers were physically like running us over. It was a crazy game. And my mom was filming the whole thing. So my way to get that anger out, like what is up with these 40 year olds like plowing us over on the basketball court? We're seventh grader and eighth graders. I sat up all night editing a video that showed every single time they like fouled us or like did something wrong. Everything I did was 
I should make a video about this. Sounds like it was almost like your way of journaling. Yeah, yeah like almost, yeah. Any project, anything I wanted to like get out in the world. And you know, I didn't film that footage. I would just take it and like put text over and zoom in and you know, so yeah. That was your personal expression. That's one of the things I think we joy the most about editing. That there is that emotional catharsis. I've had like emotional breakthroughs just because I've made a cut. Yeah, well, and because it puts order to your world. That's what I love is you take all of this footage that is so chaotic and so everywhere and a light bulb goes off and you're like, oh, this is the beginning, middle and end. And you sort it out and you see it come together. And there's no, there's like nothing better than just having an edit come together. You know, like sometimes I'll, I'll be in you know, premiere resolve and I'll just be like, I'm a genius, <laughs> you know, like, oh my God. And when people watch it, they're like, oh yeah, that's a good video. <laughs> but you're like, you don't understand what I did. This angle didn't work out. So I took this clip from this other time and put it over here. You know, I just edited my own wedding video. Yeah. And I'm like, people don't even understand what I had to do for this cut to make it, you know, seem like it was nothing. And also in the beginning days, I was really into music. Yeah. So my band needed a music video. So I would do that. Everyone needed videos and yeah, I'll edit it. I always do love those stories. So what was probably that most challenging video ever that is invisible for everyone else. Yes, yes, because good design is invisible, yeah. right? So good video edits are invisible. Well, my most recent one, I would have to say, is my wedding edit because we only planned it in a month and we did it in France and we did it very last minute. The money that we spent was more on travel and stuff. So I only hired one videographer who actually helps me edit. Shout out to Kyle. We hired a really good photographer, but video surprisingly was like, in the back of my mind. I did, cause I was like, if I have good photos, that's all that matters. It was only one person. And I just threw three or four cameras at him. I was like, I'm sorry, Kyle, <laughs> but figure it out. <laughs> and he did a great job, but only having one person shoot it, you know, I definitely had to do some finagling in the edit and it turned out really good. So that was probably the recent one, but my first one would probably be, honestly, some of my school projects, just the music videos I would, I would make, you know, discovering things like, I don't know if you guys used a ton of film burns back in the day, if oh, you did yeah. weddings yeah. and stuff. <laughs> yeah. But just like fun stuff like that, like, okay, telling the story, but aesthetically, how can I make this cooler? Every new edit, you discover something new. And so I don't think it, it's harder for me to probably pinpoint one video in the beginning, but I think just all the music videos, I had the most growth. I, I resonated with the film burns moment because I had yep. that phase. Yep. I mean, there was like a 2012 to 2015 phase where like, we're, we're all doing film burns. Cause yes. I think it's, it was a really good crutch to make it aesthetically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like if you wanted to transition to the next scene, I put in a film burn yeah. and things like that. I mean, I had a channel called What's Good London. It was just film burns every single cut. It was like film overwhelming. It was like, a, we should have put epilepsy warnings at yeah. the start. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> you start off being as an editor and just like slowly and organically, you found yourself also now being a creator as well. So person being in the front of the camera, person probably doing uh, uh, like producing, some maybe a bit of directing. Uh, I think is it is oh, it your partner or husband? Uh, John. John. Yeah. John, yeah. 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 I mean, John, John's also helping out with the production as well. You're doing all of the operation, but what that could then end up doing is minimizing the time for you to be potentially editing. That's been the biggest challenge. And what's funny is, so John, my husband, he's a YouTuber as well. So our worlds have actually stayed very separate for a very long time. Um, and you know, if we're like out vlogging, we'll help each other. But usually since he does skateboarding and I do kind of tech and creativity, our stuff is usually pretty separate. But this past month, we actually did an experiment where I'm like, hey, I'll give you a cut of brand deals if you just help me. It actually was really great. It helped me a ton. But for him, he's like, I got, I'm sorry. Like, I still have that itch to do my own thing. This is great, but we work completely opposite. Let's just go back to hubby and wife and call it a day. <laughs> um, so that was a fun recent experiment. When you YouTube, you do have to have all these different talents, but video editing, um, that was the biggest thing that I had to let go of because, you know, it'll take me 10 to 14 hours for a solid YouTube edit. If it's a simple talking video, you know, I can get that done quicker, but um, now I'm focusing a little bit more on quality, less quantity. So those edits take easily 10 hours, you know. Now also that I'm kind of tired after video editing for 15 years, yep. those edits now become longer because mm -hmm. I'll sit there and procrastinate. Yep. And so what I've learned is just having a video editor help me now will get me so much quicker to the final product because even if they do the first cut, it's so much more less intimidating now for me to go in just with the A-roll cut. 
mm-hmm. and then just like figure out the story. I'm proud of stuff that still stands on its own today yeah. because a lot of my edits, you can see the it's dated, whether mm. it's film burns or color graded a certain way. I remember back in the day, it was so cool to do everything faded. So you just, you would mm. do an S curve and you would take the blacks and shoot it up. Yep. And then everything was just ugly and faded. And that, that aged terribly, you know? But I bet it looked great at the time though. At the time, It was yeah. the thing, it was the aesthetic. It was the aesthetic, right? Yeah. What are we doing now that we're gonna look back on? I can't believe I did that. Aggressive subtitles. Yeah. 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 It's like, or like, like the subtitles like, blur, like motion blurring in, coming out your face. Yes. And it's like, and like sometimes like one word at a time yes. for, you know, to get that retention. I don't do that, but yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that's, I feel like I'm calling it now. That's going to be in three, four years, someone yeah. can look back at that and go, oh, why did we think that was good? Yeah. Yeah. At least on long form. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Long form YouTube. I'm, I'm comfortable with my like, uh, a good video being hundreds of thousands of views instead yeah. of millions of views to still be a little bit authentic to like what I want to make, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. But those people of the world, they are doing YouTube editing at its best mm-hmm. and congrats. Keep going guys. Epic views. You're doing great. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> so I think in the same way that you have a lot of creators right now copying Mr. Beast for us, it was Casey Neistat, right? Yeah. And so it's like, you can't be a Casey nice that copycat and thrive because you're always going to be second best to Casey. Yeah. You're always going to be second best to Mr. Beast. You could be the best Mr. Beast copycat ever, mm. but you're still second. So you have to incorporate your own style, your own way of storytelling, your own vibe um, in some way because you're only going to be the best you. And so yeah. you have to take the time to, to figure that out. Mm. What I was copying in the beginning was like really cool uh, like Bonnaroo event recaps. Yeah. You know, I was obsessed with the recap. Mm-hmm. So whether it was a travel film or a wedding film, I'm like, how can I make a emotionally intensive montage slash, you know, uh, working in different A roles and emotional things to make you feel something. And that's mm-hmm. what I was kind of copying. And that, that went into more docu style things and, and naturally YouTube. So mm-hmm. I think for people who are coming YouTube first, mm-hmm. it's fine to start there. Yeah. But like you said, you have to figure it out on your own. You have to tweak things. You have to figure out what it is for you. It's a reference point. Here's what's working now. Let me try to recreate that. But then use that as a foundation for you to start finding your own unique voice. Uh, I think in my case, it was uh, Edgar Rice and Guy Ritchie. Like they're, they're, I absolutely love those filmmakers. There was, a, there was a point in my life where the Scott Pilgrim versus the world was my mm. personality. Yes. And, but then... But then <laughs> I, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> But then over time, but using that foundation, start finding out what it is that I like to do as a creative as well. But that's a scary part. I think the choice to try to find what works for me is scary. But then that kind of gives you that extra longevity in towards that. Yeah. And so, yeah, we do see a lot of the Mr. Beast uh, copycat. I think that the fundamental difference in attitude is you sh- you can steal like an artist, but you need to ensure that you don't steal like a ripoff. 100%. Yeah, I think formats are a good thing to to start as a starting point, at least as far as a creator or even as an editor. So like for you as wedding travel, Mm -hmm. like that's a format essentially, like a genre of filmmaking. Yeah. And for me, I was actually copying Justin Odisho. Yeah. He was the first person to do video editor reacts to a music video. And I was like, that's amazing. I can talk about that. So Mm -hmm. let's, let's try it. I also think it's kind of, uh, getting two creative inspirations and creating a hybrid. I think it's very transparent that we've taken inspiration from Colin and Samir. But then also on top of that, I think inspiration from Calder Cruz VFX breakdowns. And so we thought, okay, what happens if we put those two together? We let's have editing breakdowns and then talk about the editing economy. I mean, that's, that's exactly what being a creative is. Like, yeah. there is nothing original under the sun. Yeah. Uh, I remember when, this is how naive I am with, like, actual narrative content because I've been so obsessed with YouTube documentaries and things. When I watched La La Land for the first time, I think it was like 2016 or whatever, I literally was like singing in a movie. (laughs) I was like, what is, you know, I I didn't have the context that that was every single movie in the 50s. It's like, you know, Sound of Music exists, right? But when I watched that, I was like, oh my, this is the best movie I've ever seen in my life. This is life changing. (laughs) And then when my mom watched it, she was was like, oh yeah, this is really good. This is like all the old school movies, you know, back (laughs) in the day. So it's like everything is a new twist on something that has been done before. If you want 
an example of like a culmination of all of my inspirations for the past decade. It's my my wedding video. I edited my own personal wedding video. And what was so fun about that is I took all of the songs from all of my favorite movies that I like uh, TV show Chuck, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, La La Land. And I use all of the music from all of those shows. And I kind of like, it was a culmination of, you know, all the wedding films I've done. And it was so fun. And I think that's what makes it fun is you can take media that you're obsessed with, that you love and put your own spin on it. I agree in all of that. Yeah. I think it's it's one of the things I find the most interesting is that, yeah, that there are trends and like they come they come on, they're popular, then they fade. And then 20 years later or next, maybe five years later, like that trend is popular again. I mean, it seemed to be this interesting loop where we're kind of like coming back and forth. And it reminds you of like the phrase, the more things change, the more they stay the same. It's like fashion, yeah. you know, like I'm wearing freaking like, look, like almost bell bottoms, you know, yeah. I, I wore tight skinny jeans for the past decade of my life. And now I'm like, the things I was wearing in sixth grade, that this is the thing now, but it's it, cool it again. feels yeah. new. Um, but like, for example, I use freaking film burns on my wedding video, <laughs> on yeah. mine, you know, and yeah. I was like, oh, let's bring these back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, I'm calling it film burns are going to make a big comeback this They're year. In. <laughs>